So that brings us to our last uh, new business item, uh, which is um, probably our most important item, quite frankly, which is the beginning of our work around the academic standards review and revision. And I know Dr. Perkins has a, um, has a brief presentation to give, but I'd like to share with my colleagues some of um, our committee's thinking about how we might approach this work. Um, today is the start of a homework assignment. And on eboard is a series of documents that Dr. Perkins will give us a little bit of background on. But it's it's for, for many of you. I know you've lived this. I'm maybe the rookie in the group, but um, but it, the purpose of these documents is to provide some contextual review and background about how we got to where we are now on this topic, previous work that we've done. And for me, it was a it was a terrific opportunity not only to understand the previous work of this board and staff but also how much we've learned since the last time we, we did this work. And uh, also contained in the documents is the um, report from the Standards Review Commission that's important for us to read, particularly the recommendations. And then, um, so the goal of today is really to set uh, at a high level um, this background work and then gain from you your ideas on what you would like to see on an agenda item in our April meeting around this work so any we're seeking your input today on anything that you'd like to uh, see contained there but to start with dr perkins could you um, give us a little bit of an overview and in particular help us understand the statutory requirements that we need to be mindful of as we proceed on this work absolutely thank you mr davis and dr oxendine for your guidance and support um, through this process and board members um, we look forward to working with you all and you providing guidance um, as we move through the process. So it is important, I think, for us to um, look at some common language and what current statute says and what state board policy says. So I'm just to do a high level overview as Mr. Davis uh, or shared, and then you'll have some additional items to review um, and read before our April meeting. So thinking about the purpose of today, the State Board of Education is committed um, and I'm preaching to the choir, to the adoption and revision of quality standards. So um, NCDPI began the review process actually for ELA and mathematics over a year ago with surveys and focus groups. We paused in order to allow for the legislatively appointed Academic Standards Review Commission to complete their work and provide additional input with their recommendations. So as we proceed through the review process, it is important to make note of the history, statutory requirements, State Board of Education policy, and other materials that are referenced during the review process. And this will prepare all board members for a deeper discussion in April. Um, so I've worked with staff and the committee, um, SLA committee, to create recommended reading list in preparation for April's meeting. So one of the documents you have um, on eBoard is a brief description and suggested page numbers of each recommended reading if you have to prioritize. Again, all the documents I think are really good to read the entire document, um, but I know how very busy you all are, so um, I've taken it upon myself to make some suggestions for you, but again, I think reading um, all of it will be helpful. So that document is included. So just a brief overview, the statutory requirements and, and SBE references, I'm going to do a high level overview of that, but I would recommend you spending pr some more time reading it, reading that actual document again to kind of, it's a lot to process. Um, so also the state of standards in North Carolina, we have Dr. Um, Jennifer Curtis, who is our section chief in mathematics, actually wrote um, an article about the state of the standards in North Carolina, which was a very rich history. Um, so I thought, why recreate that? Um, she's done the research and, and submitted that to the Centroid, which is um, a publication of North Carolina teachers of mathematics. So I think that will be a good, um, resource also response to the framework for change so I would also recommend and this is in the document of the reading list with the recommended page numbers you also have the actual framework for change which if you read that first and then read the response it will probably make a little more sense for for you and then the Academic Standards Review Commission report again I think reading the entire report would be beneficial um, but specifically pages 11 and 12 talk about standards defining standards and page 33 discusses the actual recommendations um, from that commission. And then there's a standards review and revision process flowchart. I've presented to the board before what that process is, but that just gives a visual for you 
um, of the process that we use in the, the department for standards review. So statutory, or excuse me, general statute discusses the mission of the basic education program, which the General Assembly believes that all children can learn. I think everybody in this room believes all children can learn. Um, and challenge, uh, want to challenge students with high expectations for each child to learn, achieve, and fulfill his or her potential. So the next topic in that document around statutory requirements is actual content standards, and it's very important for us to understand general statute around that. The board shall develop a comprehensive plan to revise content standards and the standard course of study, which you have, that policy. The board shall involve and survey a representative sample of parents, teachers, and the public to help determine um, what the standards will be and their usefulness. And the revised content standards um, developed in the core academic areas shall, and general statute continues, reflect high expectations, in-depth mastery, be clearly grounded in content, be defined grade by grade and course by course, be understandable to parents and teachers. One of the challenges um, with that sometimes is when you get into some of the technical subjects or the sciences and mathematics, there really is terminology that um, if you're not a mathematics teacher or a science teacher, may be difficult to understand. So we often have to be pragmatic about that as well in writing the standards using um, the content-specific language, um, and sometimes that's a little challenging um, in that area, but we're committed to doing that as much as possible. And be developed in full recognition of time available to teach. Be measurable whenever possible in a reliable, valid, and efficient manner. So all of that is spelled out in statute. Again, one of your readings um, that you have available that's attached is the framework for change. And um, one of the things I wanted to set the context before we visit this source is, um, well, so in 2007, the blue, uh, there was a Blue Ribbon Commission that was convened and to look at next generation standards, assessments, and accountability. And some of you in here were on the board during that time. So in January, I believe it was January of 2008, the commission brought to the state board the framework for change recommendations. So NCDPI was um, charged with um, implementing some immediate action as well as some long-term planning. So a response to the framework for change was developed. And within that, the Department of Public Instruction defines essential standards as content standards that focus on big, powerful ideas and enduring understandings. Essential standards are assessed in the classroom via formative benchmark and summative assessments. It goes on to say these standards will be identified based on three main criteria. The first is endurance. The second is leverage, and the third is readiness. So a lot of work, I think, was done in response to the framework for change around defining standards and what criteria um, we want standards in North Carolina to have, regardless of the content area. Um, the State Board of Education, I'm going back to general statute again around content standards. The State Board shall develop a plan to create rigorous student academic performance standards in all grades. The performance standards shall align whenever possible with the student academic performance standards developed for the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And general statute also is very specific <coughs> about reading standards. So in order to have formative and diagnostic assessments and resultant instructional supports to address oral language, phonological and phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary, fluency and comprehension, these also then must be addressed in the standards. For high school content standards specifically, it um, notes that knowledge and skills, um, it must include knowledge and skills necessary for post-secondary education or attaining employment in the 21st century economy and aligned with the minimum undergraduate course requirements for admission to the um, institutions of the University of North Carolina. Sorry, it wasn't functioning. <laughs> in addition, Session Law 2014-78 and Section 6 um, gives local boards of education the continued authority to provide for the efficient teaching of the course content required by the standard course of study. So while we as, as uh, or you all as a board, and we support as a department the development of standards, it is the local education agency's responsibility to ensure that those are taught as effectively as possible. And it also states in Section 6, the current standard course of study remains in effect until official notice is provided to all public school teachers, administrators, and parents or guardians 
of students enrolled in the public schools of any changes made in the standard course of study by the State Board of Education. So not only is there State Board policy that aligns with general statute around the actual process itself, but there is also the requirement, as would be good practice, to make sure that there is ample notification before any changes could be made or implemented, I should say. And your, uh, our State Board policy, um, going into a few important definitions, defines the standard course of study. So we visited what, a con what content standards, what we have legislatively in place, and also in board policy or previous work that's been done. So now we're moving to what standard course of study actually means. And in board policy, it means it's the program of coursework, uh, which must be available to all public school students. So you're really looking at those um, courses or course of study that must be completed for all students in North Carolina. So essentially this means that these are what's required by the State Board of Education for students to complete to successfully complete a path to graduation. Now this is a distinction that I think is very important to make is the difference between standards curriculum and curriculum guide. We hear those terms used interchangeably but they're actually not interchangeable <laughs> they do have very specific um, meaning so content standards um, are what students um, will learn and be able to do Ainsworth defines curriculum as the high quality delivery system for ensuring that all students achieve the desired end the desired end is the standard where we what we want students to know and be able to do is the is the end the delivery system to get there is the curriculum and so that in North Carolina is determined locally. We do um, develop support materials to help with understanding what the content standard means and what it might look like, but the curriculum is actually a local author is under local authority. We do have, um, again, the support materials, we don't really call them curriculum guides at the agency level, but some of the materials that we do produce to support, like the unpacking documents um, and other support materials, could, could be used in districts as a part of their curriculum guides. But these are documents um, that basically support and assist with understanding of an implementation of the standards. Generally, curriculum guides um, are just that, support documents. Teachers are not required to use them. Districts are not required to use them. Um, it allows for flexibility and are just suggestions and not requirements that teachers must follow. So a quick overview of the standards review process. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we have, I think there's been two previous sessions where we talked more about this and we can dig deeper into this process if needed in April. But basically the board has developed a comprehensive plan to revise content standards. Um, it does inv require that we involve and survey a representative sample, which we have, um, we have done that with ELA and mathematics already. And, um, the full review of available and relevant academic content standards that are rigorous, specific, sequence, clear, focused, and measurable, and all of that um, is applied in the board policy for review. That's a lot of words, but you'll see it in the document. <laughs> but there's a few I just really wanted to highlight. So in the state board um, manual, um, that is GCS-F-012, which um, defines what the standards review process needs to include. So when substantive revisions are necessary, so there's an actual review process and then if needed there's a revision process. Those are two components um, of standards review. But we must include data research, establish writing teams with content experts, submit draft for public review, um, revise draft as necessary, submit um, to the board for discussion and approval, and conduct professional development for teachers and administrators, which I think all of us agree is one of the most significant things we can invest our time and energy and funds into is preparing teachers, not just for any new changes to standards, but ongoing as they are learning to teach um, the standards. There's also general statute around aligning resources, so the state board must have an ongoing process to align state programs and support materials. And if we were to list all of the support materials that we and the agency are responsible for, um, whether it be, um, you know, curriculum 
documents that support teachers such as the um, unpacking documents if we look in home base and all the items that are in home base if we look at the professional pro pro development programs that are aligned to the standards if we look at assessments assessment items and school net so all of those things the general statute understandably says must be aligned to current standards so any changes would then mean we needed to go through a process of making sure that all of those materials are um, appropriately aligned to any changes in the standards it also requires that we ensure that teacher and school administrator degree programs ongoing PD and other university activity in the state's public schools align with the state board um, priorities and we must um, also develop and update the standard course of study in accordance with uh, general statute that I've already looked at and this specifically addresses assessments that the state board deems most aligned to assess student achievement so again that's a whole nother process is going through and making sure that our assessments are to be are, are aligned with whatever standards are in place and again in board policy we must conduct professional development for teachers and administrators anytime there are changes to the standards and then there's reference so that's a high-level overview. You can have a deeper reading, enjoy. It's not, you know, I'm not a novelist, so it's, not, it's very technical, but it's good information. I found it very helpful to create these documents. Um, and Dr. Atkinson is amazing to me because she can recall. That's how I found a lot of these things because she can re recall, and Miss Willoughby also um, was very helpful in recalling historical documents that we needed to reference and look at because a lot of work has been done um, by this board and previous boards around standards. Thank you, Dr. Perkins. That is a great start to, to this effort. And I know you're, you're working on this, but one thing that would be helpful in April is we're going to need some serious organization. So a project map, a flow chart, a, help, help us organize and be able to understand how we're going to approach this in a thoughtful way would be incredibly helpful and I, I know that we will engage our our teachers in this effort because the, mm -hmm. the purpose really in my view is to make substantive and constructive improvements to these tools to help our teachers I mean to me that's the bottom line and so I look forward to us engaging with our our teachers on that work this is just a wonderful opportunity we have so let me see what questions my colleagues have. I uh, just want, uh, in, in April, this may or may not apply, just we're in the digital age 10.0. And um, if, if it aligns, I, I see the terminology we have in here, textbooks, support materials, things like that. If there's delivery and assessment um, models that are uh, have more of a uh, uh, alignment with, with the digital age, then I would I'd like to see that or know know how that's going to how that might be applied. Great point, Dr. Oxendine. Thank you so much, Dr. Perkins, for that first of many homework assignments. I'm already out of breath thinking <laughs> about it, uh, but I would re I would encourage and kind of double down on <clears throat> the reading of all of the documents, but also to give attention to the academic standards review report and recommendations and Tiffany has given you specific pages to read and the pages so uh, I think it's 11 and 12 or 10 and I'm not sure but uh, those two particular pages will not really try to redefine um, what a standard does but it has more to do with uh, the Commission's discussions and wishes around I suppose a standard statement the statement of a standard not so much what is the standard but the clarity uh, by which this <coughs> the standard statement is conveyed and worded because an incredible amount of time hours um, were spent in the lack of clarity in the standards our common core state standards so pages 11 and 12 really get at the heart of the statement itself and I, I don't I don't mean to browbeat that point I'm just going to make it make the statement and move away from that but those two pages are important as well as uh, the, um, the four recommendations I'm looking though at the PowerPoint <clears throat> one of the frame I don't know the name the number of the frame but it has to do with a standard um, 
must be defined by grade by grade and course by course. Um, see, I see that already as <clears throat> feeding into one of the recommend, not really one of the recommendations, but one of the findings from the Academic Standards Review Commission. Uh, at the high school level, and I hope that when we begin the review revision process, we'll deal with this. At the high school level, I think it's probably, um, it could be ELA and math, but at least one of those areas. The grade by grade standard is not in place because uh, in, the con in the high school, it's either math or ELA standards that we currently have that we're implementing. Uh, the term is banded. You have a, a ninth and 10th grade and an 11th and 12th grade. So that might be something that when we began the review process that we began, we take a look at that. I know that I'm in the weeds right now. I apologize for that. But well, you are correct that in general statute, it does say um, be defined grade by grade and course by course. So that is something that I think would be explorable. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. <coughs> Mr. Davis. Yes, Dr. I, I hate to get too much in weeds, but I just want to make a clarification. Um, Dr. Oxendine, we say the legislation says course by course, but the grade span is for the choice of school districts as to whether to offer it at the ninth grade or tenth grade. So are you thinking about that we would say that a course would just be off, could be offered just at no, the ninth it, grade or tenth grade? Not so much the course, but the, <coughs> the state, the standard statements, the high school math, it's either math, I don't know, it's either math it's English or English language arts. The standard itself, it doesn't have anything to do with the course itself, but the standard covers two grade levels. Gotcha. And the intention, um, just, just historically, the intention is that those are such complex standards that need to, that need to be taught at both grades, but at a, at a different complexity of text. So the text, you're continuing to develop students' understanding of that standard or capacity to perform or be able to do that standard, but at increasingly complex text. So it really should be taught across both, but Ms. Tippett may have a... Yeah, I teach English language arts, so this is what I love about actually having it 9, 10, 11, 12, because I begin the foundation in ninth grade, and I know that at the outset of 10th grade, that is where they must be. So it keeps your teachers accountable to each other in both of those grades. They have to work together. They have to collaborate and say, okay, if we're gonna see these students make this end result, then we have to work together on this. So it almost is a forced collaboration, which in turn actually makes the product even better. Well, there's a good morning we to adopt. Oh, that's excellent. Mr. Collins. I echo uh, Mr. Davis's uh, comments with respect to process. I think it's very important for us to spend an awful lot of time in making sure that the process in which we're going to go forward is well defined. Uh, it's going to be complicated enough for us to do, do our job uh, without having to skip all over the place. I think that um, the, the Standards Commission provided us with an awful lot of information and, and I think part of that process needs to be aligned to both the recommendations and also some of the dissensions because I think that if we're not going to take a particular position, either a recommendation that, that was made or, uh, or accept a, a position, we owe it to the public to be able to, dis to uh, indicate why we're taking that position. And also part of that, I think, um, uh, some of the problems we've had in the standards in the past is the lack of transparency and the lack of participation in the part of multiple stakeholders. And I think that we as a board need to decide upon where, where that goes in the process as well. Uh, we can't let everybody have their opinion at one time, but we need to structure, or st structure it so that folks can be heard based upon the issues that we're confronting. So. Uh, just some thoughts as we're doing that, and I hope Mr. Davis will spend an awful lot of time on that before we go forward with any substantive work. Absolutely. Thank you. And our team is working on um, what Mr. Davis was asking for, um, a very structured kind of workflow or recommendation for a workflow for the board for April discussion. And then that flow chart is at a much higher level when you open that and look at that flow chart, but that will also... Um, show where various opportunities for stakeholder and public and also 
um, involvement in, in the process as it's currently written in to board policy. So again, we are we do want it to be a transparent process, very much so. Ms. Wilby? Just as a point of clarification, I think we've always used um, those principles in looking at uh, standards review. And in fact, those two of them you mentioned are spelled out in the framework for change, which is, I think, what we looked at as a process that you were asking for, <coughs> sort of a flow chart and a process for how to do the work. I think back in 2008, Seven, we eight, called eight, it eight, a it framework for change. But we talked about four principles, transparency, stakeholder involvement, alignment, and measuring our success. And I just have to say that one of the things I don't want us to lose sight of is standards don't exist in a vacuum. We have to remember that standards are related to assessment and accountability and the things that support. And I, Tiffany did a great job. I don't know how you got that much information presented so concisely and so clearly just a few minutes ago. But you know, the difference in curriculum and support and standards is really important. And a lot of the commentary that I've heard over the last couple of years has confused those things. And so I think, you know, I'm not suggesting this is the end all be all answer, but there is a starting place where we've already identified those principles. Mm -hmm. And I, I beg to differ. I do think we got stakeholder involvement and I think we had transparency in this particular um, process. Me. There was opportunity for yes. it. More than yes. Yeah. That's a great point, Ms. Willoughby. Willoughby, and it shows how the previous item, proof of concept study, and this item exactly. are so intertwined. Exactly. We've got to be working on those together. Even, we it. Well, even textbooks and yeah. sequencing yeah. and the professional development and, and some of the other things we're talking about, the analysis of student work and all those things are a piece of this that. Uh, Mr. Davis, if you could put a little graph together that would kind of put, tile those in, that would put the uh, one. It will be three-dimensional. Okay. <laughs> like a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> Other questions or thoughts about uh, what you'd like to see us work on in April on this topic? One other final comment. I read the, um, the framework for change last night and uh, didn't, I'll go back and read it more thoroughly. I glanced over it. But what I found interesting is that Several recommendations resulted from that study. I would like to know the extent to which they've been um, addressed, because one of the, the recommendations that stands out in my mind has to do with um, integrated mathematics and the need to do something with better alignment and integrate. So I'd like, that was 2008. So if you could, at some point, maybe we could uh, discuss that in April. What's happened with those recommendations? Because it wasn't just a framework, from what my understanding of this document. It's not just a, a, a framework. It's actually very good recommendations, some of which comport with the recommendations from the Academic Standards Review Commission. There's actually, there, are, there are actually two pieces, and one's the recommendation change, mm -hmm. and then there's the response to oh, the recommendation of change. And, uh, I think some of those are actually in that response mm -hmm. as opposed to the may, well whatever so yes they yeah. appear to be recommendations yeah dr. Atkinson uh, this may shed some light uh, and I'm presenting this uh, in the hope as we move forward it'll give us just a context the common core standards in math had algebra geometry and algebra one and prior to the common core adoption in North Carolina we had done the trans we had followed this but we had come to the board asking that schools have an option of offering math one, two, and three, or they had the option of offering algebra one, geometry, and algebra two. And it was a grassroots effort with, uh, led by uh, Jeffrey Cox, the superintendent, who was the superintendent in Allegheny, who came to the board and said, um, we believe, based on other industrial nations, that we need to do another approach not to have that option and we know that we'll have to go through a time of difficulty in getting to that place but the recommendation from this grassroots committee comprised of teachers uh, principals and superintendents was that we have just math one two and three and so that recommendation was brought to the board and then the board made that decision moving forward 
But that is, although related, that was not a direct um, implication of what the Common Core Standard said in math. That was the customization in North Carolina. So that just gives you the context of that. And one thing that, uh, that from my perspective worked well with our revision of the standards last time is that we ask every school district to have a team of teachers and interested people, parents and others, to, uh, as we went through all of the different drafts, we asked them to review those drafts and provide us feedback. And so all of that feedback is archived um, with the work, uh, it was led by uh, Dr. Angela Quick. So we have all that feedback, it, it feeds, it has big notebooks uh, with all that feedback. And so. Thank you for that. <coughs> all right, terrific. We're off to a good start. Thank you, Dr. Parkins. Thank you. And, Chair, that concludes our committee's uh, meeting.